Hey, welcome back to the realm of history tonight. Of course, we're getting ready for the chapter 16 quiz tomorrow. Uh, yeah, we got a sponsor. We got uh, Sophia J in my second hour, one of my fine students uh, who runs the Coco Bomb Shop. Please make sure that you follow her site on Instagram, which I had listed there for you. And uh, hey, if you're looking for a gift for the holidays, that'd be a really nice one. Coco Bombs, nice hot chocolate. Get that for your family and friends. That'd be I think a really wonderful gift and it supports local business and it supports one of your classmates who is definitely repping the realm in a great way. Uh, so thanks to Sophia for the sponsorship tonight. Okay. Um, obviously I, I think that uh, tonight is a pretty emotional day. You know, it's, uh, it's been a roller coaster today uh, for I think all of us. And um, I just uh, want to make sure that we are keeping the people at Oxford High School in our thoughts and prayers, uh, no doubt. I think if we're going to pray for anything tonight, uh, that would be the number one thing that I would focus in on. That's just an awful situation. Okay, moving forward, uh, the agenda for tonight, we've got some key advice. I'm going to keep it brief. Uh, we've got tonight, I'm going to go over some selected key terms, figures, and places. I'm not going to go through every last term, but I'm going to focus on the ones I think are most pertinent. I will take some time to go over the short answer possibilities, and then I'll give you some AP advice for preparing tonight uh, for that portion of the assessment. And then, of course, at the end, like we always do, we'll have some time for question and answer session. Uh, moving right along into the key advice, I would like uh, to make a statement here at the start. First of all, I'm not sure what you do uh, when you're watching, uh, but please pay attention. I would say if you really want to get the most out of this, put your phones down unless you're watching on your phone, um, but give it your focus. I mean, really use this time to your advantage to get yourself ready for the quiz. I would suggest writing things down. I would suggest writing things down. I did a lot of research over the Thanksgiving break on both reading comprehension and also study skills as we're getting close to the AP, as we're getting close to the AP practice exam and of course our midterm examinations. And so what I would really encourage you to do is make sure that you write this information down. Writing things down actually has a higher percentage of recall than does typing. Uh, so really when you write it by hand, it helps you master the material. So that's a big suggestion that I have for you. Uh, number two, obviously tonight, pray for the right things. Hey, this is today's a prime example of what's most important you know, and uh, what's dear to you. Make sure that you're praying for the right things. Pray for the victims of Oxford shooting. Uh, pray for your family and friends for their safety and health. Pray for your health and safety. I certainly am going to pray for uh, my family and friends and for all of my students and your health and safety. It's very important. Uh, number three, I think it's imperative right now to be here now, uh, tonight, tomorrow, over the next two weeks, when you get ready for, of course, the midterm exams, not only in my class, but in all of your classes, it's really important to be here now and focus on the task at hand because the tasks are going to start lining up. You need to get ahead of the game. I have I give you the uh, midterm exam review sheet. I had it posted on my weekly agenda last week. You need to start studying now. I mean, now it is a time to start going back to chapter one, chapter two. You know, tonight's probably mostly focusing on chapter 16, but any spare time, your seminar hour. Start chopping up that seminar hour, and you really need to use that time wisely. You stay off the phone, stay off the Snapchat, stay off the Instagram. Focus on what you need to do in these next two weeks to get yourself ready. Only you can control that. I can tell you as much as possible. Your parents can tell you. The administrators can tell you. Uh, but you're, you're the people in the driver's seat on getting yourself ready for the exam. As always, thank your parents. I think tonight, what happened today is every parent's worst nightmare. Make sure that you go and tell your parents you love them. Tell them thank you. Give them a hug. Talk to them. Okay, make sure you do that. That's very important. And then number five, you need to meet the challenge. Listen, we just came off a break. We had a review day today. We got a quiz tomorrow. We're going to have some type of another quiz on Chapter 17. And then we're going to be into a really difficult midterm exam. I'm going to put the pressure on you now. I am going to put the stressors on you now to see if you can handle it. You know, you got an AP test at the end of the year. If we don't stress ourselves, if we don't push ourselves, then we're not, I'm doing you a disservice. If I don't push you and stress you to the max, then I'm not getting you ready. I'm not getting you ready for the AP test at the end of the year. And I'm not getting you ready for college because when you get to college, you're going to have big assessments like this all the time, midterms, 
final examinations, big papers to write. So you need to get yourself focused on that and make sure that you rise to the occasion and don't shy away from a challenge. If I teach you anything, I want you to rise to the occasion. It's something that we talked about early on this year. Okay, bam, moving quickly into our key terms now. So I'm gonna go through some selected key terms, some of which I talked about today, some of which I answered questions about today, but I'm gonna make sure that we're all on the same page. The first key term that I wanna focus on is the group known as the Anasazi. Now today in the review game, if you were paying attention, I kind of gave you some of the questions that are gonna be on the quiz tomorrow, and they were predicated on native societies from North America, the Anasazi being one of them. What I really want you to know about the Anasazi, okay, is of course they were from the Southwest. They're from the Four Corners region of the Southwest. That's very important geographically speaking. And some of the other factors that I think are important is that they were very successful. They built the Pueblo buildings, which are those large cliff dwellings that were built into the side of these major cliffs. They're made out of adobe or sun-baked clay, which is kind of an orange substance that hardens with the sun. And eventually they went out of power Due to a possible drought around 1200, they sort of dissipated and a lot of those pueblos were left. Those are some of the key factors that you want to know about the Anasazi. Next is the Hohokam. The Hohokam, they were around the same time as the Anasazi. They were influenced by the Anasazi. Uh, but remember, the Anasazi go out of power around the 1200s. The Hohokam are known for developing agriculture in the Southwest with the use of irrigation. And this happens around 1500. So this is the most important factor to know about the Hohokam is the development of agriculture. They were really the best group in the Southwest to develop agriculture. Next is the Mississippian culture. The Mississippian culture was of course from the Mississippi River Valley. They are a mound building culture. We learned about several mound building cultures, two from Ohio, the Adena and the Hopewell, and then this group, the Mississippi or Mississippian culture. They were highly organized. They had many cities along the Mississippi River. They built flat topped earthen mounds where they would put their homes on because the Mississippi had a propensity to flood quite a bit. And so this would prevent their belongings and their dwellings from flooding and being ruined. So this is one important factor. They did have a major city. It's called Cahokia. If you're ever in the Illinois slash Missouri area, you will drive by Cahokia. Cahokia is a major site. It had a huge mound called Monk's Mound, which was discovered in the 1800s by French priests. This city, after studying and excavating, was known to have about 300,000 inhabitants. So this was one of the largest populated areas in North America by a Native American tribe at the city of Cahokia. Next, the Eastern Woodlands people. This is a very broad term. It does refer to the mound building societies of Mississippian and also of Ohio, but it also refers to the Iroquois. And we, we learned about the Iroquois being part of what are called the Iroquois League. They spoke a related language. And a lot of these groups are from the Great Lakes region in which we live in today. Uh, so the Eastern Woodlands people is sort of a descriptor for these groups that are east of the Mississippi River. Okay, next is the Pacific Northwest groups or people. These are the three tribes that we talked about, the Kwakiutl, the Nootka, and also the Haida. These three groups can be lumped together on your review sheet answer. What we really want to know is that they utilize the coastal forest, they utilize the Pacific Ocean for whaling, they practice the potlatch, which we know today is a potluck ceremony, but for them, that ceremony actually displayed their wealth and social class status in society. Okay, next is the Iroquois League. When you think of the Iroquois League, there's a couple of things that you need to know. Number one, the Iroquois League is a political alliance of five tribes, okay? It's a political alliance of five tribes. Those five tribes, came together for the purposes of trade and also for joint defense. That was the goal. It wasn't coming together to go and conquer others. It was formed to come together for defensive purposes and for the promotion of trade. Now, the inventor, the developer, the man who's given credit for creating this Iroquois League is named Chief Hiawatha, and that's H-I-A, 
W-A-T-H-A, and that is mentioned in your reading in the textbook for section one. But the five tribes that make up the Iroquois League are the Mohawk, the Oneida, the Onondaga, the Cayuga, and the Seneca. A good way to remember those is by understanding the first letter of each, which spells MOOCS, M-O-O-C-S. That would be a memorization tool that you could use to know the first letter, which would then translate to understanding what each of those tribes are referring to. Okay, moving our way down my list here, the next key, ther key term or thing that I want you to know is glyph. Glyph is something used by the Maya. It's also used by the Aztec, uh, but it is short for hieroglyphic symbol. It's basically a picture that stands for a sound or sometimes an entire word, okay? So the Maya, the Aztec, the Inca, they all had writing systems. Well, actually, the Inca didn't have as stratified of a writing system as the Maya and the Aztec. The Inca used the Kibu for their record keeping, but the Maya and the Aztec had a stratified writing system in which they used glyphs, these symbols that stand for words and letters. Uh, so this is an important factor that you'll need to know in relationship to the Maya and the Aztec. The Maya use glyphs to write what are called codexes. A codex is a Mayan book. Most often, it is made out of bark paper and sometimes stone. Okay, so it's a Mayan book made of bark paper, sometimes stone. Next, I want to talk briefly about the Elu. I had a couple questions about this one in class today. The Elu is like a family network system. Okay, it's meant for jobs that require more than a few people. So jobs like building roads, channeling through the mountains, large agricultural plans, these are large network projects that need more than a few people. So you would connect families, several families would come together into an ALU and they would do these projects together. This was something practiced by the Inca, okay? This is particular to the Inca in section four. Another Incan specialty, is the term Mita. A Mita is like a forced labor system where if you are conquered by the Inca, they will impose what's called the Mita. You have to provide a certain amount of work to the Incan government per year to meet these requirements. So it's a form of tribute, but instead of giving up goods or human lives for sacrifice like the Aztec forced people to do, the Inca had you do work. And that work was usually public works projects like building roads and so on and so forth. The Inca had some of the best roads in all of the New World. When I say the New World, we're talking about the Americas. That's according to the Europeans. They are the ones who wrote this, so that's where the terminology comes from. Next is the quipu. The quipu is what I was talking about with the Inca. This is a device. It's basically a piece of wood and long strings that hang from the wood. The strings would be dyed different colors. So each color stood for something. Like one might be population, one might be storage of grain, one other, another string might be uh, taxes owed or taxes paid. And what it would do is very simple. They would make a knot for, let's say, every 100 people or every 100 pounds of grain that they had in storage. Uh, it could be a different ratio, uh, but the knots are what recorded the amount of said value per category on the kipu. Potlatch. This is a ceremony celebrated by the Pacific Northwest people in which there was gift giving and bringing of food and drink, which represented your social class status. What you brought to the ceremony represented your wealth and status in society, and so, therefore, the potlatch determined your social class status. Today, we use the term potluck to refer to this. It's something that's been passed down from the Native Americans of the Pacific Northwest. Okay, next are the Pueblo buildings. Now, there are two Pueblos listed on your review sheet. One are the Pueblo natives or Pueblo Indians. These are the people who are the descendants of the Anasazi. OK, this term is referring to the buildings known as Pueblos. These are those these are those impressive cliff dwellings that we talked about, the Anasazi building that were made out of adobe or a sun baked clay. The Hopewell. 
the Hopewell built large and symbolic earthen mounds in the Ohio Valley region. They are part of the Eastern Woodlands groups and they are part of the mound building societies. Next are the Toltec. The Toltec are the direct predecessors of the Aztec. That means they came before the Aztec. Okay, so they are the direct predecessors of the Aztec. They are a very warlike people. Most of their civilization was predicated on conquering others and performing human sacrifice on a fairly massive scale. But also, but also, uh, the Toltec have a lot of religious implications and a lot of what they believed in, such as Quetzalcoatl, was passed down to the Aztec. I think another key factor about the Toltec is that they were ma major uh, workers of stone, stone masons. They, their architectural style was all made out of stone, palaces, temples, dwellings, okay? And they also passed that information down to the Aztec. We think that the Toltec may have invaded the Maya, which would have been one of the possible factors for the Maya decline. Uh, but there is only true evidence for that at the city-state of Chichen Itza, which I have traveled to and studied at. And so you'll see there that you find the Toltec version of, of architecture is square. Square pillars, square pyramids. The pillars made by the Maya are rather round. At Chichen Itza, it's one of the only places that we see square pillars and round pillars. And by carbon dating, we can prove that it was most likely around the time period of the 900s, which is when the Maya went into decline, in which the square pillars were created at Chichen Itza, which tells us that there is some evidence for the Toltec invading and conquering and mixing and blending with the Mayan peoples. The Triple Alliance is referring to the Aztec. It is the political alliance of three major Aztec city-states. Those key city-states are Tenochtitlan, which we talked about being the Aztec capital city today. That's the island city in the middle of Lake Texcoco. You also have the city-state called Texcoco, which was on the outside of the lake. They joined into the Triple Alliance as well. And the final member of the Triple Alliance was Tlacopan. That's T-L-A-C-O. P-A-N, they formed the Triple Alliance, and under the leadership of the Triple Alliance, the Aztec, with their help from the other two city-states, went out and created a major empire through conquest. Those are the things you're going to need to know about the Triple Alliance. Okay, now, the next three things, I'm not going to, I'm going to pull them up on the screen real quick. You've got the Aztec on your sheet, you've got the Inca on your sheet, you've got the Maya on your sheet. These are such big picture ideas that I'm not going to go through each one individually. What you need to do is you need to create some major categories. My suggestion to you on the categories that you need to know about these three groups would include, number one, their specific geographic location. Number two, their religious practices. Did they provide human sacrifice? Did they believe in multiple gods? How did they go about their worshiping? Remember, the Aztec sacrificed many humans. The Maya at a smaller scale. The Inca did some human sacrifice, but it was very rare. Human sacrifice is not a really big picture in the Inca world. On top of that, I think you need to talk about how did they rule? How did they rule? Were they city-states like the Maya? Were they an empire like the Aztec and Inca? How did they control their empire? Obviously, when you learn about the Aztec, they forced tribute. They forced these different groups to pay them a lot of tribute in the form of human lives, in the form of gold, in the form of agricultural products, so on and so forth. This would come back to haunt the Aztec, right? Because a lot of those oppressed people eventually rebelled. So the Aztec used a rule by fear system, which eventually led to their downfall. The Inca, on the other hand, used the Mida, the Elu system, okay? They had sort of a welfare system. They kind of were more like the Persians in which they treated the people that they conquered fairly well. Okay. All right, so the last category that I think you should know about these three groups would be why and how they declined. For the Maya, there's a lot of possible factors. We know what happened with the Aztec. I just mentioned one of them, and then they get invaded by the Spanish. 
with the Inca. Of course, they have a civil war between the sons of Huayna Capac, which were named Atahualpa and Huascar. They fought a civil war, which severely weakened the Inca Empire. And then what happened after that is that the Spanish invaded. Um, so there's some factors that you'll need to know about each of those groups. And then I really want you to focus in on why they went into a state of decline. Okay. There are some key figures on your list. There's only one of them that I'm going to go over tonight, and that is Pachacuti. Pachacuti was one of the most famous Inca emperors of all time. He is most well known, okay, for creating the Incan Empire. So the Inca have a holding in Peru. Pachacuti is the guy who uses military to go out and conquer other regions and bring them into the empire. Remember, an empire is we where you take several formerly independent states or countries or entities and bring them under the control of one ruler, which in this case would be Pachacuti for the Inca Empire. Okay, I am moving into some of the key places now. A couple of key places that I want to go over. There's three in particular that I really want to go over with you. The first one is a simple one. It is called Tikal. Tikal is a major Mayan city-state. And it's probably the most prominent city-state. It has some major ruins. Those are some of the key factors you'll want to know about Tikal. Don't need to get into too much depth. Just know that it's a major Mayan city-state, most likely the, the most prominent city-state that we have yet discovered. And we are able to study the ruins. It is, is located in northern Guatemala. Another Mayan city-state of importance is Chichen Itza. Chichen Itza is located in the Yucatan Peninsula which is where Cancun is, which is where a lot of people go for vacation time, okay? But Chichen Itza is a major site of the Maya, and we believe that at Chichen Itza, we have the largest ball court of the ancient Mesoamerican ball game that we learned about today. We saw the video of, of that today, but the ball court at Chichen Itza is one of the largest. It is, the actually, it is actually the largest that we have yet discovered. So I've done some studies there. And that's how I learned about the ancient Mesoamerican ball game called Pogtatok. Next is the city-state of Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan is the first major civilization of Mexico. The first major civilization of central Mexico. Teotihuacan was a city-state. Very massive population there. Between 150 and 250,000 inhabitants in the 500s, making it most likely one of the biggest cities in the world at its time. Also, Teotihuacan was known as a major producer of obsidian weapons and tools. So that's another thing that you want to know about Teotihuacan. Okay, now, the short answer I'm going to be able to summarize in a fairly quick fashion because I kind of went through it when I talked about the Aztec, the Inca, and the Maya. Uh, but here are going to be some of the key things that you'll need to know. First of all, the decline of the Maya. Remember, we don't know exactly why the Maya went into decline. It's sort of a mystery of history. Uh, but we do know some possibilities. And we have more and more evidence as we make discoveries in the Mayan ruins and in the Yucatan and in central Mexico on a daily basis. But here are some of the possible factors. This is going to be a short answer question. So you want to know as much as you possibly can to fortify your answer. Number one is overpopulation. Overpopulation had, can have drastic impact. It could cause an overuse of the soil for agriculture. Once you overuse the soil, if it is no longer fertile, it could lead to shortage of food, famine, and then, of course, disease. Number two is invasion. Invasion most likely coming by way of the Toltec, which I talked about earlier in this session. Number three is infighting. Remember, the Maya were divided up into individual city-states. They often traded with each other but they also often fought with each other as well. That could have disrupted trade. That could have led to the loss of lives. And it most definitely, it most likely caused people to move out of Mayan cities, which led to their decline. Current possibilities on the Mayan decline include drought. Drought could have been a major factor, which could have caused the famine and the shortage of food as well. But what we can do is we can look at the layers of soil near Incan ruins. When you look at those layers of soil, you can look at the colors of soil 
And you can tell by the different sediment layers how long ago this soil was as the top. And the, the darker the colors, the more fertile the soil may have been. The lighter the colors, the more dry it may have been. So by studying the layers of soil, we can see that there was a period of drought in the Maya world. And the impact of that could have been devastating. Okay. In juxtaposition to the Maya, right, we do know exactly what happened to the Aztec. Remember, the Aztec were treating a lot of the people that they had conquered um, very poorly. They were ruling them by fear. They were making them turn in a lot of tribute in the form of gold, in the form of food. And I think the, the kicker, though, is that they were making people provide them with human lives, which they would then use as sacrificial victims. A lot of those groups got tired of being oppressed by the Aztec, began to join together, and began to rebel. This made, even though the Aztec army was very powerful, millions of men in the Aztec army, when you're getting attacked from multiple directions by multiple groups, it makes it pretty hard to withstand and withhold that. And so that is one of the factors that led to the decline of the Aztec under the leadership of Montezuma, who's also on your review sheet. But I think the kicker here in understanding the Aztec is that they were eventually fully conquered by the Spanish. I mean, we know that the Spanish came in in 1519 and by 1521, it wasn't an easy battle, but they had overthrown the Aztec. And disease actually played a major factor in the form of smallpox in helping the Spanish win. Okay, now the decline of the Inca is a similar story, but once again, unique. We have the two sons of Huayna Capac. Huayna Capac was a Inca ruler during the Incan most powerful period. Where well, we had Pachacuti, major ruler, then you have Huayna Capac coming into play a little bit later. He makes the mistake that we've learned about in history quite often of dividing his empire to his two sons. Their names were Atahualpa and Huascar. And the two sons fight over the best territory in a civil war. And of course, that leads to weakness in the Inca Empire. Atahualpa eventually wins the war. But shortly thereafter, the Inca are invaded and conquered by the Spanish as well. So Spain plays a role in both the decline of the Aztec and the Inca. Spain did not play a role in the decline of the Maya. Very important. Okay, so there are a couple other short answer clues that I want to give you. I talked about them today in class. The first one is, of course, the way that Native Americans looked and viewed the land. The way that Native Americans looked at and viewed the land was that it was sacred. It wasn't something to be bought and sold, whereas Europeans looked at the land as being something that you could have ownership of. So those two ideologies are in juxtaposition, meaning polar opposites. And this causes a great deal of conflict when the Europeans eventually do come over to the Americas. There's a major difference in how they viewed the ownership of land. Finally, I am going to be throwing on the question about Aztec warfare and the purpose of Aztec warfare, which was not necessarily to kill your opponent in battle, but rather to capture and I think the, the bigger picture of this for the AP world, the bigger picture and understanding of how this is important is because, see, when the Spanish come, they have steel armor, right? They have guns. They have swords. They have crossbow. They have the horse. So trying to bash a Spanish soldier on the helmet, which is made of steel, to knock him out and then take him back as a captive is not going to work. Using a rope. You have to get pretty close to rope or net a Spanish soldier. The Spanish have muskets. The Spanish have long lances. The Spanish have swords. The Spanish have uh, crossbows. So they can keep the Aztec further away from them, which doesn't allow the Aztec to get close enough to capture them. So the Aztec are at a major disadvantage according to tactics and their goal in war when they come across the Spanish. And that's one of the other factors that led to the Aztec being overthrown by the Spanish. So that's why it's so important. And that's why I want it to be a highlight on your quiz. Okay. I do want to talk a little bit about the AP portion. I'm going to give you a couple of clues on the AP that I wrote down. I would say um, you're going to be focusing on the Inca civilization. So both the reading from topic 1.4 in AMSCO about the Inca, focus on that. 
but also section four in your patterns of interaction textbook focus on section four's notes and the reading there you want to focus on a couple of key things number one the inca empire how was it created how was it held on to things like the elu and the mita those are things that are going to help you understand that um, and answer the multiple choice questions to the best of your ability but also there's a, a, a factor that leads to the inca roads how were they built why were they so great what makes them so special uh, so those are things that are talked about in the reading of both um, and it should be in your notes but you might want to do a little bit of outside research to help you out too uh, but those are some factors that you're going to need to know for the ap a secondary factor is going to be aztec human sacrifice that will help you on the ap portion as well knowing why they did it how they did it as i described in class and some of the factors that are kind of pertinent relating to aztec human sacrifice as well okay um i have made it through that took us 30 minutes so hopefully you were paying attention hopefully you were being here now and uh, writing down some important factors i know you probably had to go fast if you missed anything this should upload shortly after we close off tonight and it should definitely be there tonight and tomorrow morning i know that i'm able to watch them right after i don't know if that's because it's on my account uh, but it should post and you should be able to re-watch anything that you missed and fast forward and whatnot uh, but at this time i am going to go to our questions okay i see that there are 25 comments that i've missed and um i'm going to take a look at what we have going on here okay yes yes i want to filter through kirk says uh do we need to write down the key places on the review sheet that's not part of the assignment um knowing the key places will be pertinent though i can tell you that uh, ryan and and other ballers um that is uh pretty important stuff right there okay so i don't think you need it it's not part of the assignment but you need to know them okay here's a question from john uh what should we have for weetsy lopachli okay this is a good question weetsy lopachli is the aztec god of sun and warfare so the Aztec, all of their human sacrifice, the vast majority of their human sacrifice are going to this god, Huitzilopochtli, because they believe that Huitzilopochtli, the Aztec sun god, they believe that the sun comes up because they are providing it with human blood. At night, the sun goes into the underworld and fights off the evil spirits. So this, when it goes dark, it means the sun is working in basically hell to fight the evil spirits. And the only way that it's going to rise up the next day is if the Aztec have given the god Huitzilopochtli and their other gods enough human blood for that day to nourish their needs. That was the that was the whole belief, at least in the Aztec world and the Mayan world, as to why they needed to do human sacrifice. Okay, Gabby, good question. What's the difference between the Hopewell and the Dina? They have more similarities than differences. Uh, the Adena are a little bit older, Gabby. The Hopewell uh, come into play a little bit later. The Hopewell's mounds are a little bit more symbolic in structure, like they have different shapes, like the serpent mound. And they're also, the mounds are a little bit larger because the technology was a little bit better by the time the Hopewell come into play. This shouldn't impact you on the quiz, uh, but knowing the differences here could eventually help you on a later assessment, i.e. the midterm or possibly the AP exam at the end of the year. Okay, I'm making my way down the list here. Do we have to know anything about Huayna Capac and Atahualpa? Okay, a couple things. Huayna Capac was the Incan ruler when the Inca Empire was at its highest quality. It controlled the most territory. Um, Huayna Capac is Atahualpa's father. He, When he dies... Okay, he leaves his throne to Atahualpa and Atahualpa's brother, Huascar. And Atahualpa and Huascar are the two that fight in the Civil War with Atahualpa winning. But then Atahualpa is actually the Incan ruler when they are conquered by the Spanish. 
So those are some important factors that you would want to know about those uh, key ballers there. All right, Pia says, what is the Nuka and the Haida? The Nuka and the Haida are both tribes of the Pacific Northwest. Okay, they are tribes like the Kwakiutl that were from the Pacific Northwest. And so you can lump them all together into representing the Pacific Northwest. So what you'll want to have is they utilized whaling in the Pacific Ocean. They used to utilize the coastal forest uh, for hunting and gathering goods. They also celebrated the potlatch ceremony. Alex, what should we know about the Pueblo people? So when you're thinking about the Pueblo people, you want to think of them as being sort of the descendants of the Anasazi. The Anasazi go out of power around 1200, most likely due to a drought. The Pueblo are kind of the people who come after them in the same region. There's two tribes that make up the Pueblo. They're called the Hopi and the Zuni. They also built the cliff dwellings. That's why they eventually get called the Pueblo people, because they built Pueblo buildings, uh, much like the Anasazi did. Those are some of the key factors that you'll need to know about the Pueblo peoples. Do we need to go into detail about the Maya decline? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's going to be a short answer question, Lacey. Uh, so you want to know as much as possible about the Maya decline. Um, not Tammy's decline, but the actual Maya. Okay, the Maya in the Yucatan Peninsula and in Mexico. You want to know all the factors that we went over, such as overpopulation, infighting, right? Disease, uh, famine, drought, okay, invasion. Those are some of the things that you're going to want to make sure that you have down. Ooh. Yes, Quetzalcoatl theory is one that I could talk a lot about. Let me try to summarize it for you, uh, Bella. Really, when you think about the Quetzalcoatl theory, it is this idea that there was this man, Tapoltzin, who was a Toltec, who was exiled, right? And it's the idea that he will one day come back. And Quetzalcoatl and Tapoltzin kind of are merged. Quetzalcoatl is a god known as the Feathered Serpent. Tapoltzin was a man. The Quetzalcoatl theory is this prophecy that kind of merges those two beings together. And um, it's the belief by the Aztec that someday Quetzalcoatl, the man slash living God, will return to reclaim his power because he was a noble of the Toltec. And so when the Spanish arrive, here's the idea. When the Spanish arrive, the Aztec believe because they have the horse, because they're wearing metal armor, because they're light skinned, because they have beards, because they're searching for gold, because they want the uh, Aztec to worship a different God, right? They want the Aztec to stop human sacrifice. They initially believe that the Spanish are this returning God, Quetzalcoatl, to fulfill the prophecy, right? So that's what you really need to know about the Quetzalcoatl theory. It sort of delays the Aztec response to the Spanish, and this allows the Spanish to gain time and eventually conquer the Aztec people. That's a really big factor in that. Maya, ooh, picture wars are running hard. What should we have down for the for Quetzalcoatl? Well, Quetzalcoatl is, of course, a god of the Toltec. He's known as the feathered serpent, right? So a snake with wings. Uh, but as I just explained, it eventually becomes an Aztec god and an Aztec prophecy related to the Quetzalcoatl theory. Uh, so both of these things are pertinent to know. Um, Daniel, Chief Hiawatha is an Iroquois man who basically is given credit for developing the Iroquois League. Okay, so the Iroquois League, the political alliance of the five tribes, credit is gone is going to um, Chief Hiawatha for that. Okay, Alexia says, what do we want to know about Montezuma? Well, Montezuma was the leader of the Aztec, most popular Aztec leader, most well-known, probably because he's the leader when they are conquered by the Spanish. He's actually captured by the Spanish during the invasion, uh, but he's also the leader during the time in which many of those smaller tribes that the Aztec were controlling rebel. 
So here's what you have. Under Montezuma's leadership, there were a lot of bad things that happened. He was known as the greatest leader, uh, but under his leadership, a lot of bad things happened. They were conquered by the Spanish. They had a full-scale rebellion by many of their uh, subjects that they ruled and, were, and that were paying tribute to them as well. So those are some of the key things you want to know about Montezuma. Johnny K., uh, is the review sheet online? It is. It is uh, listed in my weekly agenda under the bulletin board. You got to click weekly agenda week 14, and it, it, it is uh, listed there. So you can uh, grab it there. Okay, Reese, the Tlashkala. Tlashkala is one of the subjects of the Aztec. It's the most powerful city-state that rebelled against the Aztec. The Tlaxcalans actually teamed up with the Spanish, okay, to eventually fight against the Aztec. Uh, so the Tlaxcalans and the Spanish team up to fight and conquer the Aztec. See, the Spanish only had about 500 men. They would have, they would not have been able to get the job done just with 500 men even though they had armor, even though they had the horse, even though they had cannon, even though they had gun, the Aztec military had over 1 million, okay? So one of the key things is that we really need to focus on Tlaxcala and the Spanish alliance versus the Aztec, right? Uh, because the Tlaxcalans give the Spanish about 30,000 troops, which allows them to make some moves now. That's really the big idea there. Uh Never mind my question, valid. Okay. Waskar. Waskar is just uh, one of the sons of Huayna Capac. He loses the civil war versus Atahualpa. So he's defeated in the Incan civil war by Atahualpa. Uh, okay. Let's see. Okay, B. Salem. So you were absent today. Uh, so we talked a lot about Tenochtitlan. I'll cover it to make sure that you understand. And everybody else, Tenochtitlan is the Aztec capital city. So when you think about the Aztec capital city, it's a major island. And um, there are three major causeways or man-made man -made bridges, the only way on and off the island. Um, Tenochtitlan, capital city of the Aztec. Also, you have... Um, one of the key things about the city is it had a major marketplace and it had all kinds of different canals that you could traverse the city by canoe. So it was just um, known as the Venice of the New World, a major city, had about 300,000 inhabitants on this island. So densely populated and a very powerful center for the Aztec. Oh, Master Gannon uh, with uh, Picture Wars. This is one. This is my student of the year two years ago. Um, so I appreciate you staying on the, the review. Uh, Robespierre, you have the obsession with Robespierre. I don't. Uh, you got to let that go. You know, you got to let that go. But, you know, finish your paper, finish your thesis and submit it to me. I would love to read it if you have time. I know you're a big hockey baller. Uh, but uh, if you want me to read your thesis argument, I, I'd be more than happy to do that. Yes, uh, Big Ozog, one of the other big ballers of uh, sophomore year two years ago as well. Yes, I did just get done with the banquet. I rushed home and I'm here uh, live for the review. Yes, the banquet was very nice. Okay. Alexia says, what should we have for the Plains? So the Plains natives are really combined with the mountain tribes. So you got the Comanche, you've got the Apache, you've got the Kiowa. I'll add one more tribe. It's called the Sioux tribe. It's a very popular tribe. It's spelled S-I-O-U-X. Okay, S-I-O-U-X. And uh, when you're taking a look at the Sioux and the Plains, basically they did a lot of trade with the people of the Southwest because see, the people of the Southwest lacked food. They lacked um water okay so they didn't have much of a water source things of that nature um, those are some of the key ideas that we have for the plains trading with the southwest what the plains did have buffalo hide buffalo meat so they would trade their food 
for things of the Southwest, like pottery made out of clay, so on and so forth. So it was a nice trade-off there. What's this, Gannon? Why didn't you get a certificate? Well, boss man, uh, using your words, it was the pandemic. Uh, so we didn't have a normal um, celebration of the honors convocation that year because we just weren't in school, buddy. Um, otherwise, I think you would have gotten the certificate. And I think if you see Miss Sue Rates, which is the last office down the hall, she may be able to provide you with one. And if you really are uh, missing out on that, I'll make it happen for you, buddy. Yes, I will do that. Can I talk about the native concept of land? Sure, sure, Bella. The concept here is that the natives viewed the land as sacred. They viewed it as um, something that you couldn't really buy or sell. And so one of the things here is that um, you, um, you have to understand that when the Europeans come over, they basically do not view land this way. They view it as something that you can own. And so they're like, we want to take this land. We now own this land. The natives are like, we're going to still use this because we don't understand land ownership. And so they clash and they conflict over that. And that that's why that's an important factor. Okay. Uh, those, are the, those are the last questions that I have um, on my scroll. I see some comments, which I'm not going to go into. Um, but um, here's another one. Here we go. We have to know the factors of decline for all three civilizations. Yes, there will be there will be some questions about each regarding the declines. You're going to need to know the decline for the Maya. You need to know the decline for the Aztec. You'll need to know the decline for the Inca. There are some charts at the end of each section, section two, three, and four, which would help you. Uh, but what I uh, what I talked about in the session today is really what you want to know and what you want to write for those questions tomorrow. All right, uh, students, I am here to help you. If there are any further questions, I would uh, love to be of service here for you. So go ahead and get those questions listed out and I'll do my best to answer those. Ninety-five Theses of Martin Luther. Well, you know, Martin Luther was um, a Catholic at first, and he separates from the church, and he pounds the 95 Theses onto the door at the church in Wittenberg, Germany. And so the 95 Theses are basically his formal arguments about what was going wrong in the church. This is something that we haven't covered yet, uh, but this will be covered in Chapter 17, which we're about to head into on Thursday. Iroquois League. Can I repeat the tribes of the Iroquois League? Sure. First of all, you have the Mohawk, which is M-O-H-A-W-K. You have the Oneida, which is O-N-E-I-D-A. You have the Onondaga, which is O-N-O-N-D-A-G-A. -O you have the Cayuga, which is C-A-Y-U-G-A. And you also have the Seneca, which is S-E-N-E-C-A. It's a political alliance formed for joint defense and to promote trade. Why did the Aztec perform human sacrifices? It was their religious belief that their sun god, Huitzilopochtli, needed human blood uh, to make us basically bring the sun up every day. Uh, so that is why they performed human sacrifice at a base and just blatant um, understanding right there. Uh, Dr. Ignacy Guillotine basically invented this as a way to make executions more humane. Prior to the guillotine, they used to uh, hang people or use uh, firing squads or other tactics. Uh, so the guillotine made it or actually they used an ax and they would chop off people's heads on a chopping block. So the guillotine made death a little bit more humane. I mean, um, sometimes the executioners that were wielding the ax were killing people and having depression. And sometimes they would come there and they would be um, rather drunk 
were intoxicated because of the pressure that were put on them and they would miss and they'd have to swing again and again sometimes. And so the, um, the guillotine was basically developed uh, for that purpose. Um, I, I know I'm supporting your argument a little bit, but here's the thing, Gannon, death is death, right? Death is death. Whether it's humane or not, um, your guy Robespierre killed 40,000 people by way of the guillotine. Okay. That's a, that's a fact. Um, so I don't support Robespierre. If you do and you want to use the guillotine's invention, it wasn't his invention, but he certainly used it to kill a lot of people. I will say that. Uh, how did the Aztec? Oh, Sophie. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a crunch time. I I was thinking if you really wanted to do it, we could kind of do it over Christmas break, maybe on live, or we could do it in class uh, one of the days coming up. I'm a little bit worried about it, though, to be honest with you. I, I don't know if... Um, I'm just a little worried about the demographics of it and how it will look. So that's something that we'd have to discuss. Okay, uh, Johnny K, how did the Aztec do their sacrifice? Well, they had a sacrificing stone, and the priest would hold the uh, hands and feet of the victims. They would stab an obsidian blade into the chest of the victim, and they literally ripped out the heart and held it up to the gods, and then they would put it in like some type of canister, and they'd put it on top of the temple. That's really kind of gross, but that's what they did. I don't think the guillotine's in use today, Anthony. Um, you, you might be able to find some place that you... I, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. I, but, you know, I don't mark my words on that. Yeah, something like that there, Baller. That's a pretty good one, Luigi. Okay, any other um, any other questions? Um, or if you want to talk history, I you know, I have some time. I have some time for you. I think while I have a chance, I do uh, of course want to express my gratitude to you. You know, thank you for being here. Thank you for being such kind and devoted students. That's to my current students and my former students who join us. Uh, it's, it's nice that you come back. It uh, means a lot to me, actually. I just, I truly appreciate all your efforts, and I wish you a lot of success both tomorrow and uh, also on the midterm exam. It's really important that you prepare for the midterm exam. It's it's not an easy one. It's, uh, it's a really long test, and it kind of tests your ability. And um, the test that the guys who are in this session from that are seniors right now, that, that they, they took, it's a harder test because now it also involves AP style essays and AP style questions. What is Pueblo Bonito? Pueblo Bonito is one of the major apartment complexes built by the Anasazi. That's uh, that's one of the biggest things you need to know. It's like, it means beautiful Pueblo, right? And it's very large and it has um, a lot of adobe and it has very small windows. And those are some of the things you'll need to know about Pueblo Bonito. Plains Mountain in Indians um, are the Apache, the Comanche, the Kiowa, the Sioux. They're most well known in this chapter for their trade with the Southwestern tribes. Grace, I am training right now on Mondays and Thursdays. Those are the days that I have available right now. Um, on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, I have... I have to pick up my kids off the bus, uh, so I need to get home as soon as possible. But Mondays and Thursdays are when I am training, um, and that's both track and volleyball athletes. Uh, so we do a lot of plyometric work. We do a lot of agility work, and then we do some uh, weight training, some weight training right now. Uh, no, not at all. No, you're not going to end up like Robespierre. I mean... Um, Listen, you don't have to be successful people uh, as long as you're good people, right? Hey, success has a lot of different categories, so don't get hung up on that, okay? It's not about money. It's not about pride. It's not about power. It's more about being a good person for me. That's really my big thing. That's why I always try to incorporate not only historical content, but also life skills uh, that you might need to have. What did the Inca sacrifice? Well, the Inca sacrificed um, 
some human, they sacrifice some, some alpaca, some llama, which are native to that region. Uh, but sacrifice to the Inca was not at the scale of the Maya and the Aztec. It was, it was a much smaller scale um, for, for the Inca. Also, um, Grace, I'm, in, I'm doing a training Thursday. Uh, you, anybody is welcome. Um, so I've been training the girls track. I'm going to have some uh, of the boys track athletes are going to be there too. Uh, but, um, you know, volleyball players are welcome to start coming on Thursday. No doubt about it. I will be there. Okay. I don't see any more questions. Uh, so I think it's going to be good to call it a night. I want to say thank you. I, uh, I really do appreciate all of you being here. And uh, next Catholic Athletes for Christ meeting is going to be next Tuesday morning, 7.05 in my classroom. Okay. If anything changes, um, I will certainly let you know. But the next meeting is going to be next Tuesday morning at 7.05 a.m. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to get into the Nicene Creed tonight, Anthony. Um, we, I thought it was the Council of Constance, not the Council of Constantinople, but that's a little bit beyond my scope of uh, being here now. I'm focused on Chapter 16. I know I was talking about Robespierre, but uh, sorry, well, I'm not going to go into that one. Okay. Any other questions regarding chapter 16 or stuff that I'm wanting to get into tonight. All right. Have a great night and um, we'll see you tomorrow. Good luck. Make sure that you're ready to go. Make sure you thank your parents. Give them a hug. Tell them that you love them. Say thank you. Okay. I'll stay on just in case anybody has questions, but um, I'm going to only stay for 30 seconds more. Okay. Thank you. Thank all of you for, for being here. I appreciate you. I love you too, yeah, and I love you and I love all of my students. I really do. I hope you know that. It's important. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't, trust me. Okay. I think I'm gonna, we're at 58 minutes and 41 seconds. I'm going to let it hit an hour. Just keep it nice and smooth, and I'm going to cut it right there. Okay. Remember that this will post to my channel. Uh, you'll be able to rewatch it with all of the comments that I pull up on the screen. You won't be able to see all the comments in the chat until tomorrow at like noon because YouTube wants to make sure that there are no inappropriate comments first. So you will be able to see the live session and replay, but you won't be able to see all the comments. You'll be only be able to see the questions I pull up onto the screen. All right, I'm here for another 30 seconds, and then uh, have a good night, everyone. <laughs> Alexi, I'm not going to repeat those seven questions. Sorry, I'm not going to do that one. One-time deal, right? Review game action. Okay, hey, peace. I love you all. Have a great night and I'll see you tomorrow.